some. Uh, I'll I'll show you show you around my cell. Oh, let's see how do I do this? Oh, I just got to turn the um, camera around. I think I just do it this way. They gave me a um, yeah. They gave me a suite, an upgrade, because um, I um, I've I've had a few seminars here in years past, and so they decided to to be nice to me. So um, actually, from here I can see my building. So, uh, yeah. But you probably need a, a tele telephone. But you can actually see my one of my buildings from here, <laughs> the white one. Can you see it? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's rather extravagant for for someone like me. But uh, I guess I shouldn't complain. It's got two televisions, two showers, just completely, you know, over the top. I didn't ask for this. <laughs> Anyway, I'll see if I can log in on my computer. I'm sick. What luxury. Well, some people would call it that. I, I, would, uh, I, I think I'd rather be elsewhere, frankly. Because, so, well, after this, it's just, um, well, I get out in another three, four days, I think. Then I've got to muck around in Jakarta, uh, then back to um, Batam, uh, Singapore. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a rough couple of uh, weeks, actually. Um, so there's no, no more lazing around like in, in um, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time you did some work. <laughs> really? Do I have to? I mean, really, do I have to? Um, I actually don't have to do... <laughs> no idea. Sorry? Oh, well. I, I don't have to do any work at all. It won't be too bad, then. For, my, for myself, I could stop. Oh. I could stop. But there's sort of a few hundred other people who would say, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> you can't do that. So... <laughs> So I guess uh, I'm stuck with it. Now, what about what's happened here? I'm going to see if I can get onto my um, other account. Hmm, how do I get into this? Oh, anyway. Um, oh, here it is. This may well chuck me out. So, so, so anyway, how, how are things there? I had good sailing on a cat. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. 30 years younger on this one. <laughs> no, right. Sorry? Uh, 50 oh. years younger. We want that app too. <laughs> oh, I, I want that app. <laughs> now we haven't got you at all. No. Mm, You're no. muted, Gary. <laughs> Ah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now that the secret to looking good, you know, besides you know, a um, uh, good diet, exercise, and, and uh, good morality, is is to have the, the, the is to set the zoom up so that it enhances your your appearance. Yes, there's, there's I can see that there. totally. And what's the secret? Which yeah. button to press, please? It's there. It's there. I can tell you. Um, my daughter actually found it. I actually had a, I was on a Zoom call to my daughter in Melbourne a while ago, and uh, I was saying, "Geez, you're looking good." You know, I've never. And uh, I said, "You're using the Zoom feature, aren't you?" 
you know, she was all very flat and saying, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Because you know, he was, you know, radiant. Uh, but you know, then, then I said, you know, and I shouldn't have said it. I said, oh, you're using that Zoom thing. <laughs> and sort of just to play to that. <laughs> so uh, I, should, I should have kept my mouth shut. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's happening on the cat? Hey, it was very pleasant. Yeah, we had we had fantastic winds. We went one way, and then uh, as we had to come back, the winds literally turned through 180 degrees, and oh. we had it from the back oh. again. I oh. mean, what's not to like? The yeah. universe is with you. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, well, we're going upwind, of course, is always a, a bit of a battle. You've got to sort of do you know 90 degree tack. On a cat, it's horrible <laughs> i have to say that's where it's not so good downwind is great <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. you know you know can you know if you're about you know 45 50 50 degrees you know that's you know you can, you can power up on, on on those sort of angles mm. Mm. But once you get sort of closer to that you know yeah it's it's it, they don't perform very well compared to to mono hulls mm. uh, but at least you've got comfort, and at least you're not going to spill your chardonnay. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. it. <laughs> I see the advantage of that yes, very cool. well. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What else? No. Mm. Have you been away, Rupert? Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, um, I've done my. I've done a couple of days sailing. Probably one of my failing course. I've got. I'm back again on Sunday. I did How the is it coming on? <laughs> uh, it's great. Uh, um, I enjoy it. I mean, I, being in the sea is very good. It's much more fun than being on the, on the pond. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, it's a bit unfortunate in that we had to. But a big storm on one of our training days, so we've had half a day missed, which means we don't, we're not going to complete it until the end of September, and that's ah. pretty much the end of the sailing season. There won't be much chance to do more much before next year as a novice. How long into the winter do you sail? How? So How you've long? been muffled. I don't. I don't know. Is it me? How long into the winter no, do you sail? How, in, how long into the winter do we sail? Hmm. Um, and the end of... Well, we sail there. You, a lot of sail training goes on in October um, because it's a bit quieter on the, on the seas, really, and in the marinas, I think. Hmm. But then, now yeah, November is, is over. Second half of October, I think it gets a bit cold mm. Mm. and so dinghy no, sailing no. i don't know dinghy sailors some some carry on all, all winter don't they because they're unstoppable it depends on what kind of a dinghy sailor you are <laughs> well as a novice i think that's my problem is that unless there's safety boats out there i can't sail so mm. i can't mm. use the club boats and I've, obviously i haven't gone on my own yet so mm. Um, I'm a bit stuck. So when do you start in the new year? May. May. How long is that? Oh, yeah. oh, I've got a long time to wait now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The weather in the English Channel must be um, uh, a bit wild. Uh, is and, and currents, I, I hear. <laughs> the currents are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I don't like to hear amazing. I don't like amazing currents. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it's uh, it's it's that inshore sailing that's quite interesting because you get you get both. You have to really work with the currents and and tides a lot, mm. and and then you can also go up up a river and it's completely quiet and you end up in this amazing place where you can only see a few luxury 
villas or mansions in the because you need millions of pounds to to get to see that really because you need that house or whatever it's but you can just go there with your little boat in, and and hang out and it's free you know if there's still that access is is which is i really love that bit of freedom that almost anarchy in that's in in boating yes. where, where it's you, you're restricted by nature more than by mankind and rules that's mm -hmm. true i think mm -hmm. that which is nowhere on land like that unless you own it <laughs> mm. well it's extremely restricted traveling on land but there's you know private property there's yeah. uh, road regulations there's there's yeah just, Everything's regulated, but once you get on the onto the sea, you know, obviously, you know, there, there's still rules. But uh, yes, a lot of you know, I guess ninety nine percent of the rules go out the out the door. And, uh, <laughs> yes, you know, it's, it's a, a really big sort of, difference. Yes, it is. Mm. Mm. And getting out past twelve mile limit is, is invigorating too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at last, I'm free. And, <laughs> totally free. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. only, only the law of the sea to, to sort of worry about, unless you're sort of plagued under a country that doesn't recognise such a, such laws, <laughs> such as the US. Yeah, well, there's, it is must be very uh, tempting to say, oh, why don't we have more courses? But anyway, it was very exciting. We did this Portland Bill thing. You know, that's why I was crowing on about. Because from the beginning of my sail training in Britain, Portland Bill was the thing, you know, because you either have to go out many miles into the channel to avoid the rough waters around there, because it's a bit of a like a triangle sticking out. And it happens that the, the ocean comes up from a hundred meter depth to 10 meters in a very short time. It's, it's virtually a sheer cliff underneath mm -hmm. it in the sea. And so the water crashes against that and, and releases all that energy into whirlpools and uh, you know, incredibly rough water off Portland Bill. But there is this little, what's called the inshore passage, and you go, you go around, and it's said if you can't throw a cricket ball onto the land, you're too far out. Oh. <laughs> and okay. it's just oh. rocks, you know. It's this, mm -hmm. it's this last little spit of rock. And normally, you wouldn't be seen at that with a yacht or or a cat or anything on the water you wouldn't be seen that close to a rock in onshore winds meaning the wind blows onto yeah. the shore because you do basically a triangle you will always be onshore some onshore wind somewhere you know, unless it really would come from the north that's very rare and so it's it is uh, your whole instincts go against it because you are really so close to to the rocks you know? yeah. mm -hmm. and and the wind's blowing you on um, yeah. but uh, it, so that's why it's so exciting, oh, exciting. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> that's very exciting but yeah, you have to be exactly at the right time with the tides and mm -hmm. then it's it's like going around the moon you know you get into the tidal stream at the right time uh, time and uh, area and then the tide will swoosh you around the whole thing so it's not just that it sets you off somewhere it the tide flows in a totally six seven knot stream even in in mm -hmm. calm conditions it it, it slushes you around you know and you mm -hmm. and it's not about the wind anymore and it's mm -hmm. it's it's just fantastic feeling actually mm -hmm. you're going like the clappers you know? yeah. Yeah. and you're so close and um it's just doing its thing if you're actually once you entered that stream you're pretty helpless especially on this cat which is our friend pete who is a complete climate um, warrior and uh, he does not use fossil fuels oh so he kitted out <laughs> his cat with two electric motors uh -huh. 
which are brilliant at maneuvering at the end of the day, or mm -hmm. beginning, you know, anchoring up in calm conditions, but completely useless mm -hmm. in motoring against anything, you know, you won't go yeah. anywhere on them. Yeah. They, they motor at about one and a half knots full flat out. <laughs> <laughs> so once you entered that stream, that's it, you know. <laughs> if it goes wrong, throw an anchor out. <laughs> That's the only hope. <laughs> so it was very ex exciting and very good fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> being yeah. being that maelstrom. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait to go sailing with you two. Now three sailors. Look at that. Well, so you can. Great. You just just <laughs> drop down to the bottom. Right? Ah, yeah. Okay, I take that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe. <laughs> It's mm. not very hard to get into Indonesia, but you will have to be quarantined. So. Yeah, <laughs> and I won't get your royal treatment either. Uh, I end yeah. up in, in the clothes cupboard. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're with the plebs. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so have you looked for kind of, you know, uh, microphones everywhere? Because a suite like that, you know, will be fully mm. kitted out, won't it? Well, I was actually thinking uh, while I was walking about here doing some of my walking meditation stuff and uh, i'll just it just occurred to me this this balcony or it's actually a false balcony i, I just observed that there's actually a balcony on, on outside here but it's closed off it actually hasn't been the, the balcony floor is being built but the actual walls haven't been built and the windows can't open so it's sort of a you know a false balcony and it reminds me of that um I don't know whether you know it, there's, there's a film called The Year of Living Dangerously um, about uh, the, the 1965 um, uh, a coup in Indonesia, Jakarta, uh, and about people falling from balconies, uh, just like this one. <laughs> <laughs> or being fallen from baked balconies, is that who, who also? Knows? Who, who can <laughs> say? Who can <laughs> really say? <laughs> hmm. Well, I hope everything goes well for you in the next fortnight. The, it will, Have things calmed down a little, yeah? You, you feel your moment, absence has done the trick. The train has gone noise. cold. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, it hasn't gone cold, but the, the noise level has gone down. Okay. I guess uh, we sort of, and you know, information from other sources, including my uh, World Bank mates, Sort of giving me some intel. Um, sort of, I decided it better come now rather than sort of wait till later. But I guess it's going to be. Well, I guess I have to sort of wait till I step out the door of the hotel. I sort of really know, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, um, yeah, but you know, th th things aren't going to go well. I mean, this obviously just isn't an Indonesian thing anymore. There's there's just so many things going on now, uh, too many things going on now, not just with me I'm talking about, I'm talking about regionally and internationally. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I shouldn't be pessimistic. I'm too good at being pessimistic. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of worrying things happening right at the moment, especially with China, uh, increasingly belligerent. Um, and, uh, and of course, now the Islamists have got a a huge boost from from the Taliban. Uh, the 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 streets the the street in front of my building that I showed you, remember that I showed you just before. Mm. <laughs> or the yeah. street in front of there is full of you know even more. I think probably you know five times more um, refugees than were there before. My daughter's one of my daughters is living in that building at the moment. So she sort of reports to me. So, and there have been a few little mini riots over the past week um, in front of the, the, the building. Um, yeah, I mean, and you know, this isn't an Indonesia problem. But the, the, the problem is that that you know, influx is going to embolden a lot of um, crazies out there. Um, you know, people of faith. Can I call them? Um, 
So, um, yeah, I guess I'm not feeling particularly optimistic about a lot of things at the moment. Um, so maybe I better stop talking. Mm. It was lovely to see Pete, a picture with Pete, and he's okay again, is he? Oh, yes. Well, no, it's always good to see Pete just because he just seems to be busting with life. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, always good to see Pete. Always. Mm. I, I, I caught, I caught up with him about uh, four times while I was in Amsterdam. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was great, great to see him. Um, I wish I could have got to meet more people while I was in Europe, but I was, well, you know, I guess I wasn't in a particularly good mental state. So I just, you know, wasn't in a great mood for it. So I just wanted mm. to stay put and do nothing. Which is what I, you know, pretty much what I did. Um, oh, apart from sort of vis visiting the, the coffee shops every day, which um, we're just monitoring them, seeing what's going on. <laughs> but you know, I, I just vegetated basically, and uh, um, well, not, not entirely, but you know, um, I, I just, uh, you know, despite all the disasters that, that happened while I was in um, um, Japan. In, in Amsterdam, you know, with the, the hacking and the, all the other stuff. Um, you know, I just had to sort of retreat. I just, um, it was just way, way too much for me to handle. So I guess I was a bit um, in retreat to some extent. Um, even even my room looked like a, um, a, a retreat place, you know, a little one, one uh, single bed room and, you know, very small. It, it felt like a retreat. So it was like a, a three month retreat is, is what I call it. So, <laughs> but yeah, made, made lots of friends. Really, really interesting coffee shops. Really, really interesting. And that, uh, you know, all sorts of interesting people, um, including this, this um, smuggler. The guy was uh, 80 years old. And he's an old time smuggler, hash smuggler going way back. Uh, Dutch, um, an old Navy guy, um, completely racist, nationalist, hates Russians, hates Germans, you know, with a, with, with a, you know, a real guttural hate. <laughs> uh, but then he goes on about all the, all the great people that come here, all these Moroccans and all, you know, yes. keeps on contradicting himself. You know. Are you a nationalist, racist, or are, are you a multiculturalist? He can't seem to make up his mind. So... <laughs> Anyway, he was telling, just telling you, he showed me sort of his latest, what he was importing you know, that week. And they showed me a picture of this really, really nice, huge block of hash, which was sort of held up in customs somehow. And uh, you know, he was sort of complaining about all the transport problems he was having. And I was sort of saying, well, yeah, I can imagine you would have a lot of transport problems with hash as, as big as that. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, I just thought, you know, how could he not expect transport problems <laughs> bringing hashes from Morocco to, to Amsterdam? Of course, it's got a few problems. <laughs> so, but yeah, really, really interesting. And that's just one of uh, quite a few people. And just the entire sort of uh, community in, in, in some of those coffee shops, in, in apart from the tourist ones, which, you know, you know weren't that as interesting. The most interesting ones were, were where you had the intersection of, of the... Um, of all the old guys and 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 a few sort of straggling tourists coming through, you sort of had, you know, it just seemed to be a nice balance of sort of new people coming in and 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 the old the old guys there, yeah, it seemed to be really interesting, like you know, getting people from the uh, Korea and from from Turkey and Morocco and um, Saudi Arabia, um, <laughs> you know, it's just a, a really really interesting. Um, uh, Community, or community. I guess you could call it community. It was community of, of, uh, uh, of yeah. I mean, what what united us, I guess, was our our love of jokes, our love of uh, marijuana. So there seemed that there was that sort of solid solid solidarity, uh, that sort of um, commonality, sort of you know, I guess, brought people together. But but yeah, I just found it uh, quite fascinating. Mm. 
uh, just just uh, just the, the, the sort of communities that that uh, developed in each of these little coffee houses. I, I made a point of being a regular, just so that you know people could sort of get used to me, get used to seeing me, and sort of you know gradually sort of was able to sort of actually make more than just friends, you know, just you know superficial sort of friends, but sort of started to engage in sort of some um, more serious discussion and, and yeah, it was, it was uh, really, really, really interesting. I really liked it. Yeah. Just in the sake of research, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so you've been dossing around as a dope head for three months. Yeah. It's been great. It's been great. <laughs> okay. Hey, there are worse ways of spending <laughs> one's time. <laughs> oh, who wouldn't wish for it? I do. <laughs> um. <clears throat> And the world didn't fall down. No, Amazing. Still, no. I'm a bit more concerned about the, the near future. There's so much stuff going on at the moment. I guess I should, I mean, it's all very well to say just turn it off. A lot of people say just turn off the news, you know, and, and certainly I, I, I don't you know, consume too much news. You know, but uh, there's just, um, yeah, too much happening too quickly at the same time, it, uh, make, it makes me a little bit concerned. Um, yeah. So I'm really not sure how much longer I can really stay in Indonesia, you know, or how much, if it's gonna be safe. Not that anywhere is safe anymore, uh, but that there are safer places. So I did think about, you know, trying to wang wangle a visa in, in Europe, you know, well, actually, it had to be more specific. I think it would have to be a country visa, like a, a Netherlands visa or something. But yeah, it's obviously complicated, and uh, with all the other refugees coming through, I, I, I don't think it's going to be <laughs> going to be a high priority. But so I may well end up having to go to Australia for a while. Which Do you still? You can't. You don't have that passport anymore. I guess they wouldn't allow double. Would or could you get one back? Do you think? I I I can't answer that question. Uh, but um, I will be going to Australia. <laughs> okay. And, and there will not be any problems. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> oh, dear. It's not funny totally, but it's a little bit funny. <laughs> I wish you much luck and a long survival. <laughs> yes, we yeah. yes, survive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! Hmm. I'm looking serious, Rupert. Uh, that's just my face, I'm afraid. I thought you'd have been yeah. used to it by now. No, oh no, <laughs> no, no, no! There's certain you have certain variations. You haven't had your place. morning joint yet. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I have the coffee. That's yeah. The Otherwise, you would look like. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Coffee. Oh God, I haven't had my coffee either. That's why yeah, I look what I do. Usually you get one delivered. Do you think it's in the uh, mail? Well, I was I was hearing some grinding going on. Ah, there, so. And nothing since. Uh, <laughs> well, it takes a while. It's, it's not it's not a not a straightforward process. It's ah. so it's always but it's always very nice, so it's well worth the wait. Hmm. But yeah, that's going to need to wake me up. So mm -hmm. I was awake most of last night. Asleep. So, oh, oh. Nice. You so know too, much, too much cheese. That was a problem. Very strange. Too much cheese? <laughs> See, I had some cheese. Is that a euphemism? Or... <laughs> no, no, it's just really cheese. I was just like, oh. <laughs> so my like, stomach was all over the place. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, mm. but. Uh, how about your scan? Nothing sinister, no? We don't need no, a, no, just, it was just, a, just uh, uh, let me off my worries. <laughs> it was just a, a, a thing. That, uh, a thing? Because, okay. I'm, because I'm getting old, they send you these things. Oh, right. Uh, I forgot what it was. Mm. Something to do with the uh, aorta. Um, 
it was anyway they just it was like when you're when you're pregnant not that i've been pregnant mm. often, but they, they do a you US, you, yeah so ultrasound yeah yeah mm. and mm. they said no oh, you're fine in fact you're so fine you're not even going to bother doing this again so <laughs> Very much, very good, very good. <laughs> so, good old National Health Service, but no, I'd forgotten that I've got it, it just popped up on the mm. calendar. Mm. But no, uh, now I've started uh, um, wood carving again. Uh, I've been doing quite a lot of building in the, in the house in the garden because uh, there's lots to do, and then, I, and then I get very tired, so I have to have a little rest. Yeah. So I've gone back to doing some carving stuff. I might come back to doing some drawing as well, so that I can do that over the winter if I can't do my sailing. So I was just looking out the window because that's what's in front of me. So yeah, so it's feeling there's sunshine today. And we also have lots of visitors coming, which is nice. Lots of what? Well, visitors, lots of people. I, yeah. I think because we're on the coast, people mm -hmm. come and see us. So. Mm. so we have quite a lot of work to do, so to get things ready. So, so there's plenty for people to sleep. Well, you're very busy in Hastings during this time, because we went ashore in Lyme Regis. I, uh, you know, and we're lucky not to be trampled down, basically. It was just phenomenal, the amount of people on the south coast uh, in the towns. Uh, and we, we only went ashore in Lyme Regis. Um, but it, it's, I mean, it's just completely couldn't cope. That town couldn't cope. It couldn't feed that many people. And it couldn't, it, it's amazing. It, it was, I've never seen anything like it. You know, you had to walk in step up the high street and stuff because there was just no getting out of the maelstrom that, that flowed up and down in in a concerted manner. It's just incredible, the, the amount of people. So was Hastings very busy? Yeah, Hastings is like that. Hastings is a proper seaside town. And in the summer, I mean, during the holidays, Everybody comes from the Sussex, I guess, and Kent down to Hastings. But we're, we're very lucky because we're next door. We're because we're in St. Leonard's. Oh, is, okay. Although it's the same, it looks the same town, but in fact, it, it started off as two separate towns, and now that you now you can't see the difference. But St. Leonard's has its own character, and it doesn't have the tourist attractions that Hastings has. So Hastings has got fun fairs and boating lakes and all of the stuff and the fish and chip shops and everything that you want for a seaside holiday. Whereas St. Leonard's is a sort of throwback to the Victorian era of long promenades. And uh, some great, nice architecture. But, uh, ah, look, got it. <laughs> Hello. Oh, look at. Let's say hello to you. See you later. <laughs> but yeah, so it's, so none of this is nice. It's a, it's got different. Uh, it's a different atmosphere, uh, and there's very few tourists because why would you come? Uh, and that's where the sailing club is. That's at the that's at the other side. Where so ah. that's quite nice as well. And, uh, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's nice because you, you, can, you know, if you want to get involved in the hustle and bustle, then you can go across to Hastings where it's very lively. And there's lots of music as well. It's a big um, music town. So they, they haven't had as much as they normally do, but there's lots of festivals and lots of pubs have live music and it's a it's a it's a, it's a big center for for music hastings or some Hastings. Leonard's. yeah that's mm -hmm. but some is a sort of overspill but it's only 
it's a 20 minute walk between the two. So from our house to Hastings Centre, it's about 20 minutes. Um, but it's very different. It's a, so it's quite good. It's, it's, mm. uh, it's, quite, it's quite enjoyable uh, to have the you know, contrast between the two. And we're sort of divided by the pier. Because Hastings Pier is sort of about halfway between Hastings and St. Leonard's. And St. Leonard's used to have its own pier, a Victorian pier, but uh, they blew it up in the war, I think. And then they never repaired it. And then so they, we just had this little plaque. Uh, but I think, Gary, you should, you should rebuild St. Uh, Leonard's Pier. I think that would be a uh, you know, you can park your boat on it. Yeah. Be, uh, that sounds it like be a, a, it's that'd be a that nice needs, project, exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> and I think piers aren't expensive to build. So <laughs> just and a bit of scaffolding, ballroom. really. <laughs> yeah, just it should have a ballroom at the end. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there's some really nice photographs of when it was a Victorian pier. And it, it, it's great to think that that was what was that was entertainment. That was what you did. Mm. You got dressed up and you went out and you had a you went out to the end of the pier. And it was great, and you hang out. And the, the new pier, the one at Hastings, is now owned by the public. It's owned by um, Hastings it's, because it was it was quite a complicated story, but it was burnt down and then it was rebuilt. And then it was privately owned. Then, well, publicly owned. Then it was privately owned. Now it's publicly owned. And they've built a, a, a quite a nice pavilion on it. And there's the end of it. This massive. There's this huge open area with no buildings and just lots and lots of uh, tables and chairs and uh, and music and quite often live music. Um, so you can sit and order drinks. And, and apparently it's the largest open air um, sort of pub, I suppose, in the, in, in the country. Um, it's like 150 tables. You know? So you can always sit down. And we went up there for, they have Pirate Day here, um, which is a competition with Penzance uh, in, in Cornwall. As to how many people that can get to dress up as pirates, and it's it's quite good. There's about ten percent of the entire population, <laughs> to pirates, which was was fairly impressive. And then at the end of the pier, they were, well, of course, they're all pirates, and they're pirates playing pirate music. It was, I, I think I'm going to quite enjoy being here. It's, yeah, sounds very amusing. <laughs> quite a lively town. Mm. Well, that, that was the pirate coast, wasn't it? That whole, that, that whole southern coast? Uh, not really. I mean, there, there were smugglers. I mean, you know, your friend would be here at home. <laughs> yes. And it was quite, it was quite frowned upon. Uh, it was, it was a, mainly it's a fishing, fishing village. And it's the, mm -hmm. Hastings is the last um, beach launched fishing fleet in Britain. So there's no harbour in Hastings. Mm. So they drag all the boats up onto the shingles. So it's very and shallow, shallow sort of tidal. It's, yeah, it, it used to have a harbour. but The Germans saw to that, I guess. <laughs> well, the, well the, not to the harbour. That was that was sort of medieval. I think it was the more the, the tides and the things that changed the harbour. Mm. The, no, the... the the Germans changed the architecture. Well, actually, they gave an opportunity for a change in the architecture because it's very Victorian. And uh, there's some weird, but some very quite nice Victorian architecture. And then, so you've got a terrace that would be a, a literally sort of a mile long terrace of Victorian houses. And then that's a bit missing. And they've rebuilt it with a 60s monstrosity. And you just think, whoa, why would anybody do that? And of course, it was, it was bombed. And then, it was, and then they, when they got money back in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. then they rebuilt it. But they, they were just, they're just dreadful. <laughs> Pretty much every new build is, is appalling. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Um, there's one, maybe one or two that are, are, are okay, but it's, it's a shame because they clearly had no money um, at the time, and so mm. everything was done on the cheap. But now the money's coming back in again because people are moving down from London, people, people like me, I guess. And, uh, but also a lot of people are working from home, so so they've decided why not work from home by the sea rather than doing a one bedroom flat in London. So the prices have gone up enormously, and the, the, the there's a, a massive change in the uh, the amount of money and the the things that those people want. So there's a big change in that in shops. So it's it's quite interesting. It's a bit like Hackney on Sea. It's, a, it's got the same sort of change that we saw when we saw when we were there. <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's okay. It's, it's it's interesting. I'll have my coffee and then I'll be more awake. <laughs> You're looking better already. Mm. <laughs> Yes, I think it's the infusion yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just having it Don't under your on. nose just kind of lifted the spirits. <laughs> How's the wood wood carving going? Uh, and is it your own tree? Is it wood carving or what is it? Well, I'm not really clear. Um, uh, it's called green woodworking. I do. I used to do quite a lot of carving, and. Uh, then I got into wood, the uh, green wood carving. And green wood carving is, is wet wood. It's where mm. you just chop the tree down. And there's a, been a revival in it in, in Britain. Uh, it obviously, traditionally, it was a big thing all throughout all of the, throughout the whole world, I guess. Um, but the, all the skills and the, the tools sort of all disappeared uh, during mm. the last century or so. And people have started to revive, and so then you now get specialists, makers of the tools. And there are a few groups of people. Most of them, I've realised actually, um, then then they're interested in the crafts, but they're not really interested in so much what they do with them. They're not interested in. Uh, the, the artistry of it, they're more interested in that. Yeah, the craft. you can do this, you can use these things and you can make things. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in what you can do with the materials because mm. uh, living, using, if you use seasoned wood, if you use just traditionally what you use, then it's a bit like, it could be anything. You can, you just you can chop it, you can cut it, you can work it mostly and, and make anything you want out of it, unless it's got wild grain, unless the grain's going all over the place. But pretty much, you know, that's how you can because it's a, it's a sort of an engineering material. But with green wood, it's not like that. It's almost as if the stuff's still alive, um, and you have to work with the, the nature of the material. So you can't, you can try and say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make one of these and you can force it to do it but it's quite hard and what i'm finding is that you can you can sort of set off with an idea of doing something you have to work with the material you have to find out where it's going and so there's this you get to a stage where there's a sort of a, a sense of um, working with the material in order to find out what can be, what it's capable of and what you're capable of together. And I find that very interesting and it's very meditative. It's, uh, you you, you realise that you're just working with, you, you've got a sense of what you might want to do, but you have to keep changing because you have to go with what's there. Mm -hmm. Not You can't force it. You have to be flexible and not have a sense of the outcome. You're not, I can't definitely do this. Well, I could, but why, why? Well, it's much more interesting to see what's, what the material is capable of. So, so what sort of shapes do you 
typically or what sort of things do you typically make from 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 green wood uh at the moment i make bowls and spoons mm -hmm. um, yeah. i've normally got this all over the place hang on Just imagine you had a bit of green wood in your apartment. You could whittle away there, Gary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that would be okay, such so a that, good pastime. That's a bowl. Lovely. Mm. So what sort of section of, of the tree would that mm. be? Well, the interesting thing is when you make a bowl, um, you do it the opposite way you'd think. So the tree is actually here, and that's the center of the tree. And so this bit is to the outside of the tree. Mm. And that's why you've got this, because that's the top and bottom of the tree, and these are the sides, so the tree goes around that way. And the reason you do it that way is because the this is the, you can't see it, it's too. I've got a knife. That's a little bit of a shadow. But it, in here is the, the center of the tree. So the, mm. this is the heartwood. And then out here is the liver wood. And is the, the just under the Cadmium layer. This is where the tree was actually growing. Also, mm -hmm. right now. So this is full of water, and this is much less water in the centre. And so they, and because the rings are much closer together, they dry out at completely different speeds. So when you cut the tree down, it's it's drying at different speeds. And if you did it the other way around and had the, had this as the, as the outside. Um, this bit would dry much quicker and crack. So you but here and there, it would crack all the way around. But because it's cut the other way around, they dry sort of the same time. You have to dry it out sort of fairly slowly mm -hmm. to make sure it doesn't crack. Um, but it's um, so it's things like that that you you have to know the material. You have mm -hmm. to work with it in a particular way. So. But this one, I don't know whether you can see, but it's off center. So that is to one side and it turns to the other. And it's the same there. This one is also off center. So it's not. So the, and that's just the nature of the tree. So that's, you can't see it, but that's where the rings are. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with the. With, with that. It's not something I would set off to do. I wouldn't sort of draw, do a drawing and say, well, I'm going to make both of these off center. But it, it, it's, it's interesting in that because that's what the wood is, that's what the wood does. That's what I'm doing. And the other interesting thing is that you work with it in, you can see maybe a little bit more there. That, that each one of these leads on to a different plane. So as you work round, you get different effects so, so against that. Mm. And you get a different shape emerging because it's you know mm. obviously working in 3D. So you get very different forms emerging. So as you're working it, you're constantly considering not just what the bit you're working on, but how that affects the next bit of it. Mm. So it's intriguing. And that's, I mean, that's, but there's a, that's again, part of the figure of the, of the wood. So you, can, you know, there are interesting things that emerge. And it's, uh, so I, I, it's a sort of a sculpture that is 
sort of uh, tactical, I suppose, as a whole. Um, but the the nature of the making of it is what's what's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But you you, know, you also end up with stuff that's going to be quite quite nice. Mm -hmm. What about the curing? How long does it take to actually dry out completely? Same, same as normal wood? Oh no, within, because it's very thin now, I mean, mm -hmm. suddenly this is only uh, between five and 10 mil, I guess. Uh, it dries out within two or three days. Oh, you exactly. just leave it in a plastic, you leave it in a plastic bag, uh -huh. and then you open the plastic bag. Within a week, it's fine. So, so that's and how you will, cure it? You cure it by putting it in a plastic bag and letting it sweat. So, so just not so it doesn't dry out too quickly. If if, oh, it, okay. if I made it, if I carved it and then left it outside in the sun, it would crack. Uh -huh. I see. Because it would. So you just all you're doing really is is letting it dry slowly. So, you, so you sort of the plastic bag slows down the rate of drying. Yes. Uh -huh. it, it, but you can sort of get if it's a very humid day. You sort of can gauge, and also if you if you you know you can sort of feel the wood. You sort of can tell whether there's tensions in the wood, mm. and if there are tensions in there, they're likely to break out. And there is that wood from your tree. Uh, this is yeah, I think so. Yeah, this is a bit of sycamore, and we cut down quite a few trees here. Mm. Uh, but that tomorrow, I'm probably going to go to a. a a gathering of a local group, which is up in Kent. And there's a guy there who owns a, um, a woodland, which he bought about 30 years ago. And he's a lovely chap. And uh, he he just thins the woodland down. And so he's got quite a lot of timber there. And he just says, you might just help yourself. Mm. So we have all the gear to cut our own blanks and things. And, and the other nice thing is, other than a chainsaw for cutting the trees down, after that, everything is done with axes and knives. Uh, so this is and then that's and a hook knife, which is a bent knife, which you would yeah. so it's all um no very, chisels. Uh, no, I mean I've got a gouge, but I haven't used it yet. Oh, amazing. But, yeah, an ads is great. It's it's like a curved axe, and uh, it's uh, it's a, it's very satisfying. Mm. Because you're, I say, you're working direct with the materials, and you can see things emerge as you're working. Uh, I'll get you another one. Mm. <laughs> now you've got me started. It's very fine. <laughs> I love it. Mm. He's lost a bit of weight too. Shouldn't have said that. Okay. I want to see the tool. Yeah, I got a few bits of wood lying about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There must be a great um, carving, wood carving um, tradition in Indonesia. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Because but that's, but that's where I where I started out my businesses in Indonesia was with. Um, um, antique reproduction furniture. Oh, uh, really? Uh, huh? Extremely intricately carved with uh, you know, traditional designs. And I mean, I mean, um, the use of teak in in Java is, you know, goes back, you know, hundreds hundreds of years. Uh, highly ornate, highly carved teak sort of doorways and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. like, place called Japan. I heard you talking about my weight. Oh, uh, uh, you heard? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, uh... I was hoping you brought some tools back. I want to see what you carve with. Oh. <laughs> you I want to see it? your work too. Yeah, the ads. I want to see the ads. Yeah, yeah. We want to see the <laughs> hook <laughs> knife or whatever. <laughs> I mean, okay, okay. Did you say oh, that? Yeah. Did you Can say hook yourself, knife? <laughs> no, I'll just show you these while something else. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is one which another a guy showed me how to do, which is where you leave the bark off. Nice. Um, yeah. 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 But that's a sort of 
It's a sales gimmick because everybody says, oh, that's clever. How does it do that? That's a bit of a pain, actually, and I don't particularly like it. So <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the other bowls, and you can see they're all... I've got the norm of this one is I'm just a bit the idea was to make it more uh, eccentric. Hmm. So, hmm. Um, oh, they have, they have, have such good is, shapes. So this one hmm. is less uh, finished. So this the finish on this one is directly from the from the knife. Yeah, that's what all this stuff is here, and that that's considered to be far more authentic rather than sounding off. But you know, it's a bit of an affectation. I know it's like I do little ones to bear. This is a bit of cherry because of cherry juice, is quite small. Let's have a look at the spoon. Oh, yeah, I do spoon, but this is not. But my, this is my. <laughs> Gosh, my, you've been busy. Oh, I've been doing this for oh, a while. Nice. That is know, nice. I, I make spoons that you know, stand up. <laughs> this is my, my latest. Uh, the spoon as a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Eat that. Spoon and take it. <laughs> ah, I'm going to make it taller. Yeah, there can. we go. <laughs> oh, very good. That's my first standing spoon. <laughs> well, now on, most of the spoons I do are different. Okay. They you will should all... patent that standing spoons. <laughs> <laughs> it also works like that. Oh. The dual function spoon. We have, well, it doesn't really have much. It's, it's mainly for looking at. It's not, I mean, it, you know, you have to eat with that. I suppose you could serve, but. You could serve something could, very nice. You could serve gruel in an orphan. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to give me a minute. I'll just go and get the other tool. <laughs> Look, we get the, go the whole course. So you, you, um, what was your role in that business? You, you commissioned the oh, pieces, and well, and um, no, what, no, what I, did you I do? I set up the companies for the people who wanted to do the exporting and manufacturing. So I was basically the link, bringing them into Indonesia, setting them all up in terms of the legal status so that they could export. So, okay. And they were the, usually foreigners, oh yes. uh, non-Indonesians that wanted to export that stuff mm -hmm. and they needed to therefore yeah. found an Indonesian company to do that with. That's right. So ah. This was in, in the days just after the, um, uh, the, the, the fall of the Suharto dictatorship. Mm. The, uh, yeah, pretty rough couple of years. But there was, you know, a, a bit of a cowboy element in that industry at that time, just because, you know, that they were the only people brave enough to sort of come into Indonesia at that time, you know, probably from about you know, ninety-seven to about you know, two thousand and two or thereabouts. It was pretty much a no man's land as far as far as foreigners was concerned. And so the only people that actually went to Indonesia at that time were, well, cowboys, um, you know, doing sort of, you know. Um, hit and run exports and things like that uh, but but uh yeah so 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 most of the business business was just you know, doing a lot of traveling around uh, central java uh with you know wood wood carving and uh furniture manufacturers uh, all using either teak or ma mahogany um hmm. that most of the carving was i you know, used mahogany uh, oh, but uh yeah. oh what the hell is that that's an ad, <laughs> is it? I thought that was an implement from the pirates show. Yeah. <laughs> this is my posh axe. I've got another one, but this one oh, wow. is uh, this is got from a guy in Croatia, and he he works with a local blacksmith who makes these from from scratch. 
And so he designs them and the blacksmith makes them. And they're, <laughs> they're very, very difficult to get hold of. Um, they, because he sells out, he sells out as soon as they, he makes them. Now it's about 200 quid, I think. But it, the nice thing is you can hold it like this, <laughs> which means that when you're carving, you can use it um, really much like a knife because you can get so close to the blade. And because it's got such a long blade, you, when you cut, you can cut like this. So you'll, you can use it like a you know, shaving of a knife. That is amazing. Uh, what a it's, so it's a nice, it's a nice thing. It's, a nice it's bit just beautiful. Can, it's also very attractive, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's incredibly sharp. Uh, mm. I, can, I can shave with it. Oh, please don't. Shave don't. The, <laughs> please don't. Blood. Shave the hairs <laughs> off my my. Arm. <laughs> um, and so it's, this is a, a carving axe, and you can get all, all sorts of different ones. This one is um, ground on both sides. But you can get them where they're ground just on one side. So if, if you're right-handed, you grind it just on one side, which means you can get incredibly close to the material when you're working. It works a bit like a a, a plane, mm. a plane of blade. Mm. So you can you can actually make things square. How much did that cost you? It was about two hundred quid, I think, mm. just a bit more. Yeah. But um, he can well, pretty much hand. change what he likes because mm. he's, he's. But I saw this. You one. have to be nice to him to get one. Is that mm. that's what you say? Well, you just. I mean, he he makes I don't know maybe twenty a year. Um, mm. oh, yeah, I mean, they, they aren't, you can't make that many. So, uh, uh, and as soon as they go up on his website, they just sold sold out. If you so at the minute they're there, they're gone. So, so you you lucky. just so, monitored his website and well, he tells you what's going to happen. And the okay. first time I went on that, and I thought, oh yeah, maybe I'll get this, maybe I'll get that. And after about five minutes, I thought I'll decide it on that one. And they don't, everything is gone. Ah. So then six months later, he does it again. So I think right, and there were two left. I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, it's it. It looks like it's actually it's got a funny little bit there, which is a bit annoying because it catches on. So I think I might have to cut that here. So mm. there's that, and then there's this, which I don't have a proper cow. This is the ads, mm. and this is the thing that you use for the inside because the <laughs> it cuts that way. Um, but you can use an ads for pretty much anything. You can use it um, for cutting the outside of, of material as well. So, but it's this one is quite a tight curve, um, which means that it's particularly good for mm. getting it inside the door. So it removes material very quickly. Mm. And this is also very sharp. This is a guy in uh, in the UK who. Um, makes these like blacksmith, so that wasn't that wasn't quite as expensive. And then the knives. This is the this is the knife that you use. It's just quite small, but again, it's um, it's very sharp. Um, and the, the the key thing about this is that you. Know, You've got to have incredibly sharp tools uh, to do anything. So you you spend as almost as much time sharpening stuff as you do using it. So but that's how the, do you that's sharpen the, them? What do you sorry? use to sharpen them? Um, well, I've got a little. I've got various things, but I've got a diamond stone, which is probably the, the most useful um, because it's it's quick and easy. But I've if if I'm going to completely um regrind it then i've got other kit that you mm -hmm. have to spend a bit more time and, and a strop is very useful which is just leather uh, yeah. with some like uh, 
paste on it. Um, and this is the hook knife, which is which is what you use for the okay, inside of but, uh, but the inside of the spoon. Mm. And doing that, because the, the tree is obviously going this way, so your grain is going that way. And if you cut with the grain using this, it just lifts all the grain, so it's a nightmare. So you have to cut across the grain, mm. pretty much always with a hook knife, which is sort of the opposite of what you might think, um, because you think, well, it doesn't give a good finish, but in fact, because it's so sharp and because the wood is wet, um, you get a nice finish. Um, mm. So that's how you do it. So that's, that's sort of they're the basic bits of kit. And I've got a few other bits and pieces as well. Do you test the, the wood for moisture before starting to carve? Yeah, you, you don't want something that's too dry because. It, you can read, I mean, I've got some things at the moment which are a bit dry, but I've just put them in plastic bags with, full of water. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they're wet again. So, because wood is hydroscopic, so it, as well as giving up water, mm -hmm. it will take it water back in again. So you can, um, you can leave it to soak and so long as it's not too big a piece. And you can start to to work it again but yeah it's very hard if it's dry timber particularly some timbers things like oak beech and they're really bad when they get hot when they get dry but just a, a nightmare so is, is that why they use that for, for mahogany for um for carving rather than harder woods is, 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 is that moisture content that makes it easier to? No, you, if you if you most carving is done in seasoned timber. Yeah. So if you things like oops, this is not mine. This is from this is from uh, uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, this is a, a local timber. They just call it iron wood, but this is is incredibly hard. But this is all done um, with seasoned timber. So this is very high resin content and very low water content, and it's very hard. Um, and you you just use chisels with this, chisels and a mallet, yeah. and you're, that's what you can it away. Whereas mm -hmm. I don't use any, very rarely, in fact, I don't at the moment, I don't use any, um, uh, I don't use a mallet at all. Mm. So everything is done with the hand. So an axe or your yeah. hands are just, and there's no way that you could work with that. So mahogany is the same as that. Really. Mahogany is very uh, hard and high resin content. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, 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 kind of, we wouldn't use mahogany because we don't have any. I mean, the, the other thing is you use stuff which is local. And uh, yeah. so we're only using uh, timbers that you can get here. Um, but Generally speaking, I don't know. I mean, I can't. You might be able to work wet, a green wood, modern, but generally speaking, with things like that, you you have an idea of what you want, and so you want something which is stable and which you don't have to think about the nature of the material. You're just going to carve it to make the thing. Um, you're not bothered mm -hmm. about the the wood. Yeah, that, that's the the problem with uh, mahogany, wet mahogany in particular. Is that if you if you carve it and then and then it hasn't fully you know uh, there's still a lot of moisture inside it uh, because mahogany does seem to retain a lot um, it'll just crack um, mm. I I used to get reports of container loads full of carved mahogany completely ruined because it sort of you know went into a, a dry climate like Australia and got <laughs> which just completely fell apart. Um, it's uh, very, very sensitive. And it seems if you, if, you, if you don't get mahogany extremely dry, which is very difficult to do in Indonesia. Um, yeah, I would imagine. It I mean, it, yeah, it's 
it's it's generally speaking, as I say, if you if you carve stuff, then the idea is you you sort of set off with a plan of what it is going to look like. So you want something that's stable. Um, you don't want something that's going to move. I mean, they, everything that you've seen here will these will have shrunk by between five and ten percent. So that much. Get, they get a lot smaller than when you start off because mm -hmm. the, the, when the moisture goes, they just everything gets a bit smaller. Which is why it's very difficult to make furniture from yeah. green wood because all the joints get smaller. They all shrink. Everything falls apart. So you, mm -hmm. you have to think about the construction um, because you know that things are going to get smaller. So it, it, it's possible. I and mean, then obviously in, in medieval times, that's all they used. They didn't, I mean, oak building in, in Britain particularly, because it was a lot of oak and they used it for a lot of building. That was all green wood because you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't wait a year for it to season. You cut a tree down and you cut it straight away and you'd use it for your building, which meant that you had to think about the fact that it was going to get a lot smaller. So all the joints were going to get smaller. So everything has to work so that they will make the joint, if anything, stronger mm. rather than less strong. Yeah. Mm. And you use things like... Uh, You know, this idea of a square peg in a round hole, but actually that's exactly what you use because the, you could make a round hole, but if you put a square peg in it, then you the, the peg will catch on to all of the sides. If you put a round peg in it, it will get smaller and fall out. Mm. So you, you would use... And Interesting. That because it's, mm. because it's um, green wood, it's soft enough to embed itself into the into the hole that you're putting mm. in. So it's the things like that, which nowadays, you know, you get your IKEA furniture and you put your dowels in and the dowels fit perfectly because nothing moves, everything is mm. dried out. But um, in the past, this is these are the techniques that people have used. So it's 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 quite interesting. And if you look at the the roofs in uh, medieval buildings and how they're done in, in churches and large halls and so on. You can see the fact that they're built in order the compressive forces mm. to lock the whole thing together mm. rather than fall apart because mm. you know there's going to be weight on it, you know they're going to get smaller, you know it's going to shrink. So you have to make all of those considerations. Mm. It's quite a skill to relearn because, of course, mm. with modern materials, Season timbers, you don't need any of those. Well, well, I actually saw probably a lot of those traditional methods uh, when I was in when the the, the um, antique reproduction furniture industry was sort of going in uh, late nineties, early two thousands uh, in in Java. Um, it was all traditional tools. Um, um, the, 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 pro, the a lot of the problems actually occurred when they exported it because even though you know they might have tested for moisture in in Indonesia once they took it out of Indonesia and put it into a, a dry climate you know it would just completely fall apart or just you know, even mm. teak you know, it, would, it would, would crack um, just because you couldn't test that moisture and they couldn't predict when, when we want to make some, make some intricate furniture you know that there's there's really no way of telling which way it's going to sort of shrink and bend and uh, and so yeah yeah well it, it, I mean central heating is a is <laughs> yeah yeah and, uh, because we have very dry homes with very low humidity and, mm. and, and warm but I'm all year round they are effectively like a small kiln yes that's and true. you're just drying out everything mm. which is why if you go into a Victorian house in the UK the floorboards don't fit. There's all big gaps. Mm -hmm. There was no central heating, so in, so those boards would have swollen. Now they just shrink because of the central heating, and they get so big. Because so they, they, this this hydroscopic action is no longer there. You're just taking the moisture out, which is why furniture 
and timbers in the UK and in most of Western Europe are kiln dried now. So you put them in a kiln and you know exactly the moisture content. You can take the moisture content down to a, a level which you know is going to be acceptable for. Yeah, I, I used to um, do a moist, I used to have a moisture tester, um, which has sort of had lots of clients doing, doing furniture exports and they sort of started using these moisture testers, uh, which, which actually did improve things. You know, once they came out of the kilns, they'd be tested. Uh, you'd sort of see a moisture level, you know, which was often, you know, you'd get a satisfactory reading from, from, from the wood. Uh, but, the, but the problem was that you're still in, you know, the, the wood was still in a, in a highly humid environment. Mm. Probably going to be very many months there. So even though it was kiln dried, it would then just you know, suck it all back in again. Um, so it was, yeah, uh, absolutely. It was a race, no, no, no. like a race. So do you never carve from the, like, you know, the horizontal, uh, 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 like a round of tree, you know, like a, you never do oh. that. You always carve um, along the the trunk, do you? In these other, is that yeah, the, you, the secret? Um, well, the, the, you, what you're talking about is, is cutting um, across end grain. Mm. Um, you can do that. Uh, it's, but again, what you're looking there is very, it's very stable, and you're imposing your design on the timber. So I've got a, this is not one I. <coughs> wow. <laughs> That's a panel I learned on. Um, uh, recently, it's a, a Japanese uh, carving, and that that started in in the way you're talking about. But effectively, somebody's got the picture in their mind, and they're imposing the picture on the wood. So you want something that's stable, and it's not going to move, and that is going to be responsive to the to the to the tools, and I can do it, but I'm less interested in that because that's me making a decision prior to working with the material. So I've decided this is the picture, this is the painting I'm going to make. And I'm just responding, I'm not responding to the material, I'm imposing myself on the material. And that would be that. from a piece of wood like that, you know, yeah, across. I mean, that, that, that isn't end grain, that's um, with the grain, but it's a seasoned piece of wood. But it's the same idea. Um, yeah, because can, that is actually very stable, that kind it, of this is stable horizontal. It, it's seasoned. It's, yeah. it's because it's dry, and once it's dry, it's not going to move. Okay. As long as you keep it in the same state, and then it's been varnished to stop it and moving anymore. Mm. But if you're working, as I say, with wet wood, then there is much more influence of the material. You can impose yourself on it, but it's a sort of pointless exercise. It's much more interesting to see how the material responds. And so the design changes as you're working so you're constantly in a set in a state of um, unpredictability it's a constantly it's constant uncertainty mm. um so you're not you're not saying i'm going to make this which is I, with this i did you know i, I pretty much decided that that's going to be the shape it's going to so I imposed myself on the material in order to do that. But with something like this one, the, the shape emerges from the from the tree, from the timber. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so it's a mixture of me and the timber. And I find that a lot more, it's a lot more dynamic. So it's a, it's a much more interesting 
process to be involved in because the, because of that lack of certainty because you just don't know mm -hmm. what's going to how things are going to emerge and what you're looking at is the change constant change as you affect one bit of it it changes the shape somewhere else so you're constantly moving it around so your awareness of the the, the whole thing is uh, is heightened whereas i could if i'm i could do an orthographic drawing so i could do a three views like a uh, house you know front elevation side elevation plan view i can do that and that's what it's going to look like so i can draw it all and say i'm there cut it to fit it's going to be exactly what i predicted but mm -hmm. there's none of, none of that happens when you work this way although i could do it that way it's much more a sense of I've got a sort of vague idea of what I'd like, and let's just see how it goes. But you're taken over by the material. So it's a much more close working with the material, mm. which is, um, it's fun. It's very, uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, that's, that is, I mean, I've always been intrigued by by making something of wood like that, so thank you. I'm I'm so amazed at what you know, a masterclass of it. I well, feel. you have to come and do something. <laughs> I've got I've, I have a tree stump in the garden, which is uh, which I use for my handle. So, uh, and it's got lots of bits on. It, so, I can, I can work with other people. So, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Um. It's also very interesting, isn't it, it in, in this pursuit of what is creativity. And I, I get that, that if, if it is that conversation, then it is, for me, what, what is interesting. But you can find that in other things, too, like sailing, you know, when you're in that conversation Absolutely. with the elements. Yeah, I think that's exactly the same. It, it's, it's, it, that's why I say this artistic way, this artful, artful way of living is, uh, is in many, in many areas. And I think in most uh, areas of our life, it is like that. But we're not so artful about it often. We, we're kind of quite clumsy. But um, because no one teaches us how to do this well, everyone just teaches us the imposing way. And then we all fail at that, usually, because it, the world mostly isn't like engineering. And so th these are the very few exceptions, you know, you might, even in the building, even if you have all the elevations, I've done enough building here to know that in the end, you know, that stone sticks out, that uh, thing crack opens, it, it's the same as wet wood carving much more often than, than uh, the real precise hoof house. Uh, engineering, you know, pre to the millimeter tolerance and all that. And so there are examples like that, but they're rare. And most of what the world isn't like that. And it, it requires that artful conversation. And, and, uh, and, and true art is an example of that actually gives us, yeah, it, it gives us an insight into that. that. That is how one should live in that creative way that is a conversation rather than an imposition as you say and it, it's interesting i don't know you gary you might not have read it because it was circulate you circulated it to this dharma group about I, I sent it to did you send about... it that maslow thing yeah. oh yes yes Yes, oh, you did see it oh, yeah. because I think that's where, it, where, where you know, he's partly right. He starts off right with this really uh, describing the the intuition or this, this in the the first spark quite well, I thought. And then there's this, there's this. Then he he veers off into. You know, then it needs to be tempered by the rational being, and then goes into. All of of Descartes, 
and and uh, uh, so it's clear for me i i get he get he gets scared of so much freedom in a way and so much conversation he 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 says then you need to tie this down to uh, to rationalize it to 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 make it something very reasonable again and only like that is it is it a good life and and i think that that is an overemphasis of that rational uh, thing you know he he only leaves the the initial creative spark to the conversation feels to me like and then it has to be you know something concrete mm-hmm. and i i said no no darling i i, I don't right. agree with you <laughs> it was, I, it was a good article it was a, in a, a very uh, you could you could saw you could see the dharmic threads all through it uh, just you know you could see the thinking even though you know all the perhaps all the, the rationales and that were perhaps less than perfect uh it was um you know i mean i've, I've read you know mass flowing universe and all that thing but i didn't really notice that sort of stuff i really didn't take him all that seriously it was just too structured for me um mm. Although that's a bit of a contradiction because I actually do like structure, but yeah, it did. It, it, uh, it was. It, 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 I it, was it, just it, like, Ooh, and that's from Gary. Well, yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, it seemed to be, be too too arbitrarily structured. I guess that's probably what uh, what I really mean. Um, mm, I, I love a bit of structure, uh, but you know, sometimes structures can be arbitrary or just plain wrong. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's quite. I thought. There's a, loads of things in it. I, the bits that I liked from Maslow were the fact that he looked at the process. Yes. Because most of the most of the work that's done by philosophers and psychologists that I've read has been about people, process, and product, and they they focus on those three things sort of equally. And for me, the product is just part of the process and the people are incidental so it's the the key thing is the process and the the reason i thought that was good was because he he focused on that and the other thing was that he recognized the importance of play the fact that it was from children play that creativity comes in the first place yeah and that we lose it through this culturalization process Mm. And those, so those things were the, the bits that I felt were. Yeah, fun. there were some really interesting bits in it but, that uh, I uh, hadn't uh, seen. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the other thing I think is what you were saying about sailing. And I noticed that I, I did some sailing a long, long time ago and I'd sort of forgotten, but I sort of must have remembered why I liked it. And it's that bit that when you're out and the, you're controlling the main sheet and the rudder with a tiller and and you're hanging out the boat so there's that constant working with the fact that there's the sea there's the wind there are these bits in your hand that they are moving all the time so you're pulling your everything is a slight adjustment in order to get the thing to work and Mm. those things are you working you're not you can't impose yourself on the sea, or the wind. No. you have to work with them in order for them to work, for the thing to work, to the process to work. Mm. And that, that to me, is identical to what I'm talking about with the process of working with the timber. You, you've got an idea, you'd quite like to get to that boy, right? That's mm. your sort of vague aim is to do that. But in order to do that, you have to work with the things, you have to work with natural things. And there's no getting away from it. And it's even it's more immersive in the in the boat because you are literally sort of immersed in the natural world. If I'm in my garden with my tools and things, and I can impose quite a lot to stop a, a sailing boat. So I think that it's it's got a lot of similarities um, and I, I'm sort of very much intrigued by 
by that process, that sailing process, as, 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 as you say, so just, it's just creative because you're working with, with the natural elements in order mm -hmm. to, for the whole thing to come together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's very simple. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying about creative life generally are the things that yeah, we do have this sense of us imposing ourselves. Something, and it's this thing about being separate from the universe, being separate, being identities, being people which are separate from the environment, which is, you know, that's where the whole problem starts. Mm -hmm. When you consider yourself as something outside the environment, then the only way to interact with is to impose yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's completely wrong. It's the idea. Doing it that way is a big mistake. Yeah. Heidegger says the artist has to become inconspicuous. So only the making of art stays. The outcome is much secondary. It's that I say would say the same thing, the process of of um making it happen from from something that's a tree uh to the bowl, that process is, uh, well, he says it like that. I might have mentioned it before, from earth to world. So before it's just, a, it's a tree, it's earth. Um, and you wrestle, the artist uh, communicates with it. He sometimes says wrestle it into world, which is what we then would call a, bo a bowl, which is a, it's a concept. We can, you know, so you can put something in it and all that. But you, you're, or it could be a piece of art. That's also um, a, a, a just a, a giving it some some word, basically some name, and, uh, and then we can have it in our human world. From so, but the the, the piece of art. The material <clears throat> has to stay conspicuous. It it matters in a piece of art if it's a, from wood or plastic um, a lot. So it doesn't disappear like in a tool. That has this discrimination from tools um, where, where uh, the material disappears. Uh, in a piece of art, the material shines. So you really make this um, earth which is just uh, what what is around us the givens the reality of 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 um, of this planet in a way on the universe you you make it shine basically now this is a beautiful wooden bowl um and that that is imp an important component in his um definition of what art is about and that's later Heidegger who got very, very um, receptive. So the conversation is uh, in light, later Heidegger towards the, the, um, the nature, towards what's a given. In, in earlier Heidegger, it's very, very much the human involved. So he, he changed from that. And he only got interested in art in his later years. Um, when and and that was probably a bit of a of a parallel process that he got more open to inspiration and what's coming into the human being from its surroundings uh, and what's made of that into the process than he was before so it, when he wasn't interested in art at all he was more about how we define things and all that this is um yeah but it's, and I'm intrigued as it is called the art of living. And then I think I had a conversation with two people from this company I worked with for a long time. <clears throat> and they say, they say, oh, what have I done with my life? You know, there's this young person who got a, fam or got a family, um, is very skilled in, in their job. Uh, just renovated a house from scratch with his family and um, um, uh, oh, long lists of things. And um, 
uh, he's, he's unsure if he's done well because it wasn't following a five-year plan, like, you know, like uh, you'd, it, it was too much drifting for his judgment, you know, too, too much just getting into things. The house came along. Uh, it, it suggested itself. The baby just happened, you know, the, uh, the, the, the um, wedding uh, wasn't really planned. Um, that that kind of it, our um, what we learn in school, what society tells us, that all these things don't don't uh, they're not so valuable if they don't come out of a kind of a planning exercise and following your plans and you know like in a in a job appraisal, how do you see yourself in five years or whatever? And I guess it's it's such it breaks my heart, you know. When actually what he did was take the opportunities and um, uh, um, turn towards what what came his way, and it's a beautiful life. And look what he's got to show for it. Um, it's it's so amazing how that can fall foul of our evaluation. Yeah, and I, but I do think that there are, is a, a, a generational change in attitudes that, that I see in my generation to the, my kids' generation. In my generation, there was much more emphasis on a career and, mm -hmm. uh, and a, an ordered structure to a career. A sense of what you should achieve, whereas I think there's much less of that in the in the, the next generation. There's a far. Do you, more do you feel? Uh, absolutely, and and they with them and their all of their peers, pretty much they're all of a sense of well, things will change, things will happen, will will we will adapt, but they're not fixed on. They don't have a sense of this is my career. That's what I'll do. They just they just move from thing to thing, and uh, <clears throat> it's a much healthier. And um, I'm amazed that they're like that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased. I think it's great. You brought them up well, I would say, I because there's so. a think, there's a I lot of other me. young people who don't think like that, and they beat themselves up for for not doing it right. So well done, you know. No, I don't think it's me. Done. I just think it's that that I don't think I did it. I would have thought I probably did the opposite. But it's their there's it's not them, it's their, their whole peer group think mm -hmm. that way. They're just mm -hmm. much more flexible, they're much less concerned. I mean, maybe it's to do with the fact that you know we you know the whole extinction revolution thing, the rebellion thing, you know, it's the the fact is that the world is changing and we've impacted that and, and there is a huge amount of uncertainty now hmm. and there's no point about trying to impose ourselves on the world is is moving we have to move with it well the whole the whole know, I, of, of a career i i you know it's not the same as what, what it was when perhaps we were at school um uh, I mean, I mean, it, it used to be that that, and I'm not speaking for myself, but I, but for most people in my generation coming out of school, you, you, you chose a path, a direction, a career. Um, you, you, you mean you might be able to do that to a certain extent here for certain you know, uh, now for, for certain professions and certain types of jobs. But in the main, these days, if you're not multi-skilled and, and multi-directional, you, you, you're probably not going to get a job. Nobody, you, know, you, you just you have to remain extremely flexible now, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, and, and you know, not everybody likes it. I don't. I don't there's a, you know, there are downsides to that. Um, but you know, I think the, the well, the way that my well career. <laughs> We call it that, uh, and it compares with most other people of my generation. Is, is you know, I would say my experience was much more akin to, to what my children are going through now, 
um, or at least my younger children, um, than, uh, than what I, I went through uh, or what my generation um, went through. There's no certainty anymore. Uh, your job could disappear in a moment with, with you know, the flick of some AI. Um, you know, you become redundant. And, and that, that, that applies nearly to, to every single profession. There's, there's not a, a single profession that's, that's uh, immune from that sort of uh, you know, uh, creeping technological um, things that are happening um, that eat into people's skill bases and make them less relevant, less important than what they used to be. Um, and so unless you have, you know, unless you're multi-skilled and, and you have not just multi-skilled, but, but have a synthesis of, of different skills, it's, it's pretty hard to, to get a job. Not that I've really ever had many jobs, but, uh, but from my children's experience, uh, that, that's what I've found. Um, I mean, unemployment has really been um, a feature of uh, most people's experience uh, over the past well, at least 40 years, at least. Um, and, and it's all to do with, you know, skills becoming redundant or, or, or not, no longer relevant. Uh, that there's no career, there's no real, not as many career paths as, as there used to be. Um, and those that remain, I mean, that they, they are also under threat. Mm -hmm. Doctors, lawyers, and the whole, all the classical professions, I mean, they're all under threat. So, or all, all, all being eaten into, um, you know, by technology. So it, it's, I mean, I, I think we're sort of coming to a point now that, you know, universal basic income is going to become inevitable. Uh, the, the question is how much blood. <laughs> blood May you be in. right. <laughs> I, well, it's just a question of how much blood is going to have to be spilled before it actually happens. Uh, is it, we're going to do it the easy way or the hard way? That's that's mm. really the question. <laughs> Things we, like I, that. I better go. Yeah. We've mm. been going a while. How long? We have what? Yeah. Um, one hour, 45 minutes. I think it's time to go. I'm going to. Ah. <laughs> Amazing, huh? Well, oh. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, with all these tools, I'm going to have to go and do some carving now. You have to. <laughs> And one day I want to, I want a real masterclass, please. Oh, <laughs> I come with like. my own branch or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, I I love that. I will look back at that if they if we have the recording available. As oh, yeah. such, I really love that, and I love that. Gary says universal income is going to happen. That gives me hope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, like I said, I think it's really a choice between, you know, it just has to happen. Uh, and it's really, it's really just a question of, you know, how much conflict is, go is there going to be involved in actually getting it there? Um, I mean, it's, it's some kind of plain sailing. Hmm? Hmm? It'll be plain sailing. Plain sailing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very <laughs> good. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're dealing with people, and uh, I haven't got a very high opinion of them. So. Mm. <laughs> oh, some are all right. Okay, well, eh? well, you're right. We have to go. So, yeah. Um, okay, okay. Bye. And uh, okay, see you again. Lovely to see you all again. Lovely to see you. And um, yeah, keep keep the info coming. I was sort of so interesting to read that Maslow and all. Yeah, cool. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Bye.